Okay. Um, welcome everybody to our eighth um, bootcamp session for developers. Um, today's session, we're going to be talking about how you all can leverage IRA funds. Um, so we are going to start off with um, Todd Nedwick from NHT, who will walk us through the different IRA funding opportunities and requirements. Um, since most of these programs require meeting an energy performance target rather than funding individual measures, um, Joshua from New Ecology will share an example scope of work that achieve 20% energy savings. Um, then we'll take recommendations from New Ecology scope of work that were shared on cohort calls and outline what IRA programs can help fund this work. We'll break into some small groups for you all to share what, the, what opportunities you think will be most helpful for your portfolio. Um, share any challenges or questions you may have and what type of additional resources would be helpful for you as you go after these funds. Um, then we'll talk about next steps for our technical assistance participants. And since this is our last IRA bootcamp, um, we'll share how NHT plans to continue to support you and other developers moving forward. Um, but with that, I'll pass it over to Todd to get us started. Great, thanks so much, Madeline, and welcome everyone. Um, yeah, so as Madeline said, I will uh, kind of provide the, the latest and the greatest information about uh, the funding opportunities through the Inflation Reduction Act. I, I wanted to start with this graphic, um, which basically lays out the timeline for uh, spending uh, the, the funding for these programs, just to underscore that at this point in time, uh, the only funding that is out on the street is the Green and Resilient Retrofit Program funding. Uh, and we'll talk some more about um, the GRP and, and some of the updates. Um, so we are still waiting for much of this funding to really hit the ground. I know it feels like we've been waiting for a while, <laughs> um, but the, the good news is that, um, or yeah, yeah, good news mostly, is that uh, in mid-2024, a lot of this funding is going to hit the street. And so um, I think for me, that underscores the importance of really thinking about um, what what next steps we want to take in terms of our portfolio uh, and what opportunities do we want to, um, you know, what, what scopes of work do we want to uh, pursue and what funding do we need to do that? Because um, uh, June 2024 is not that far off, obviously. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, yeah, so next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the HUD Green and Resilient Retrofit Program, GRP. So I think you all have probably heard of the GRP. Um, the IRA provided $837.5 million uh, in subsidy and uh, provided uh, $4 billion of loan authority to HUD to um, uh, invest in uh, HUD-assisted multifamily housing uh, to achieve a, a range of um, upgrades, including carbon emission reduction, water energy efficiency, um, benchmarking, uh, improving in their air quality, zero emission uh, generation, building electrification, uh, really a comprehensive set of measures that address both energy performance and climate resiliency. Next slide. Uh, the eligibility for the GRP is, is fairly limited. So it is uh, properties that have PBRA, Section 202, Section 811, and in some cases, Section 236 are eligible. Um, so that really does uh, limit, uh, unfortunately, the, the universe of affordable housing that can take advantage of this program. Next slide. So there are three cohorts uh, through which uh, HUD is distributing the funding for GRP, and they, they vary in, in a few ways. Um, uh, for example, the elements cohort is uh, intended for projects that are uh, really uh, at the final stages of a recapitalization. Uh, these are properties that have uh, financing lined up and are looking for some gap financing to um, upgrade uh, the proposed, their proposed scope of work to a more energy efficient uh, scope of work. Uh, the leading edge uh, cohort is um, for more innovative whole building retrofits that meet advanced certifications. Uh, in the case of the leading edge, the property does not have to be uh, close to uh, closing on a recapitalization, um, but the intent is for uh, building owners who are thinking, you know, in the short term about rehabilitating their property uh, uh, to uh, impact the scope of work and um, support them achieving uh, advanced energy efficiency performance. And, and the comprehensive is for whole building retrofits for properties that 
uh, really have significant need in terms of energy efficiency performance, as well as um, that uh, properties that experience they're at, at risk for uh, climate impacts. Uh, the funding per unit and per property varies from $40,000 per unit for the elements up to $80,000 per unit for comprehensive, which just, again, uh, underscores uh, the, the sort of the range and the scopes of work that these uh, cohorts represent. So uh, there is a total of funding for, the HUD has put out estimated total funding for each of the cohorts, 140 million for elements, 400 million for leading edge, and $1.47 billion for comprehensive. Um, and uh, there have been a, a series of um, application um, rounds already. Uh, and I wanted to share sort of an update on where things stand in terms of that funding amount. So for example, for the elements award, um, we are aware of one, uh, one sort of uh, cohort of, of, of awardees um, that, uh, uh, were all allocated across the total $18 million. So there's $122 million left in the elements cohort. We are awaiting um, the, the results of uh, the second round of applicants. So that number will obviously change. Um, for Leading Edge, there's a $400 million budget. And uh, based on, after the first round of funding, there's uh, still $297 million left. And then for the comprehensive cohort, uh, we have not had any um, applicant awardees announced yet. So, um, you know, right now it's $1.47 billion. But of course, once we get, once we find out uh, who the awardees are, that, that number will go down. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think it's important to uh, note that there is a significant amount of funding still in the program. And um, as you can see here, several upcoming uh, application deadlines. Next slide. So I thought it might be helpful to provide some information about the most recent um, elements in Leading Edge awards and some kind of uh, characteristics about the, the, the properties that uh, were, uh, that received an award. So like I said, $18 million in funding um, was made available through the round one of the elements. Um, the average award per property is just over $666,000. Four thousand twenty-six total units uh, were awarded funding. Uh, most, obviously, the majority of which were, which are HUD-assisted. And here's just a look at some of the sample GRP improvements that um, were proposed for funding. You know, solar, heat pumps for HVAC, hot water. You know, windows. Uh, GRP will uh, pay up to thirty percent of the cost of, of, of more efficient windows. Uh, insulation, building envelope. Um, resilience measure, measures such as cool roof and also appliances. So I uh, just wanted to give you all a sense of what um, we're seeing in terms of the specific types of improvements that are funded and uh, as you consider your, your scope of work in your properties. Uh, next slide. And then for the leading edge, the first round of the leading edge uh, awards, um, 103.4 million in funding was uh, awarded uh, to uh, projects uh, 16 projects, 14 of which um, chose surplus, surplus cash loans and two uh, chose grants. The average per property, the average award per property was 6.5 million um, and 1,800 units um, are, are in these in these buildings. Uh, and then the, like I said before, the leading edge really is intended to support building owners in achieving pretty advanced building, uh, green building certifications. Uh, and so out of the uh, certifications that um, HUD um, uh, makes that that building owners can choose from. Uh, here are the here's the breakdown. So uh, the vast majority, nine of the uh, twenty six or sixteen, excuse me, um, uh, got uh, the National Green Building Standard certification, followed by LEED and then Enterprise Green Communities, uh, and then um, Passive House and International Living Future. So uh, next slide. I also wanted to highlight the sort of geographic distribution of these awards. Um, HUD has made a goal of uh, uh, basically awarding um, these grants and, and loans to properties in every single HUD region. So here you see a map of, of the HUD regions. And if you look at the, the first round of element awards, you really do see a concentration in the, in the Midwest, you know, mid-Atlantic, Northeast. So um, there are a lot of, uh, HUD regions that have not received any elements 
awards yet. So um, I don't know if that's because there weren't any applicants from those regions or if there were applicants and um, the application was not um, complete. And so um, HUD did not um, consider it. So just something to keep in mind if you are, uh, if you have a portfolio located in some of those HUD regions, um, that there really is an interest on HUD's part in spreading this out across the country. So that might provide a competitive advantage to you if you're considering applying. Next slide. And this is just for the, the leading edge, really kind of the same, the same trends uh, as for the elements. Next slide. Sorry, Todd, before we um, move on to the next, there was a question about what type of new construction can qualify for a GRP. Yeah, so new construction can qualify if, um, but it has to have a Section 8 contract. So if you're transferring, you know, a Section 8 contract from an existing building to a new building, uh, then that that building, that new construction would qualify for GRP. But the sort of bottom line is there has to be a, um, a housing assistance, a project-based housing assistance um, uh, contract associated with the property. Um, and then I wanted to also highlight that HUD has an energy water benchmarking initiative that is active now, um, just uh, opened up for uh, applications. And so this is, a, these are free benchmarking services to GRRP eligible properties. So basically the same universe of properties that can, can that are eligible for GRP qualify for this um, service. Uh, it's important to note, though, that you do not need to be a GRP awardee to participate in the program. Uh, and the services provided include um, assisting building owners with securing with securing uh, energy usage data from utility companies, um, helping building owners to analyze and identify um, opportunities for savings uh, through their benchmarking data, um, assistance uh, using Energy Star Portfolio Manager, and other various technical assistance training and, and other resources. Um, so HUD expects 9,000 properties to participate in this program. And like I said, they are taking, um, right now they're, they're interested in hearing from uh, building owners that are interested in participating. And you can um, uh, indicate your interest through uh, this email here that we will uh, certainly share out uh, in the follow-up email to the, to the webinar. Next slide. All right, so moving on to the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Next slide. This is an EPA program that includes a total of $27 billion uh, spread across three different competitions, uh, the National Clean Investment Fund, the Clean Communities Investment Accelerator, and Solar for All. Uh, and these different competitions vary in terms of, uh, slightly in terms of eligible entities and in terms of uh, what types of projects um, will be will, will be funded? So the NCIF um, includes fourteen billion dollars that will be uh, distributed to two to three national nonprofit financing entities, and those nonprofit financing entities will uh, essentially develop uh, capital products uh, to support uh, decarbonizing uh, and uh, energy efficiency in uh, various. Uh, various uh, sectors. So uh, building sector, also transportation um, and distributed generation. So solar, for example. Um, the Clean Communities Investment Accelerator uh, is $6 billion that will go to two to seven nonprofits for the purpose of basically uh, providing capitalization to community lenders, um, as well as providing technical assistance to community lenders. So that community lenders can um, serve low-income and disadvantaged communities um, uh, with financing. And then Solar for All uh, is uh, $7 billion. Uh, this is all that has to be spent uh, to benefit low-income and disadvantaged communities. Um, and this is open to, in addition to nonprofits, states, territories, tribal governments, and, and municipalities. Uh, and Solar for All, as you can imagine, is really intended to support deployment of uh, so, uh, renewable energy, uh, solar energy in low-income communities. Next slide. So EPA has um, established certain project priorities for the uh, GGRF. Uh, the three priority project categories are distri distributed, distributed energy generation and storage, uh, net zero emissions buildings, and zero emissions transportation. 
And I wanted to zero in on net zero emissions buildings, because I suspect that's of most interest to, to this group. Um, and there are specific uh, sort of um, definitions or you know, qualifications for meeting that net zero emission building um, priority. Uh, for new construction, that includes build, ensuring that buildings are highly energy efficient, um, energy use that is at least 10% lower than the energy code, uh, free of on-site emissions, so no um, fossil fuel emissions uh, at the property, and then powered solely from renewable energy sources. For building retrofits, um, EPA has established that uh, to qualify for funding to be considered a priority project, uh, again, highly energy efficient. Uh, in this case, uh, that can be demonstrated by having an energy star score of 75 or higher. Um, make a substantial contribution to moving towards net zero emission. We don't know exactly what EPA is, is thinking there. We expect that uh, once the, the funding awards are announced, there'll be more information about what it means to move towards net zero emissions. Uh, and then a, a commitment to um, achieve net zero emissions within, within 20 years. Next slide. So just to, to provide a little bit more information about you know, the eligible financing products that will be available through the uh, National Clean Investment Fund. Um, first of all, at least 40% of that $14 billion must be used to provide financial assistance in low-income and disadvantaged communities. Uh, and EPA has provided quite a bit of flexibility in terms of how that financial assistance um, should be structured. So that includes debt, um, loans, partially forgivable loans, unforgivable loans, um, zero interest and below market interest loans, really across the board, various different um, types of debt products. Uh, it includes equity, um, hybrids, as well as credit enhancements. Uh, you do not see on this list grants. Uh, EPA has been clear that um, this funding cannot be structured as grants, um, but um, can be structured as uh, forgivable loans. Uh, and then the funding that's going to be uh, provided through the NCIF also will support pre-development activities, market building activities, and program administration activities. And I think in terms of pre-development activities, um, we're talking about supporting energy audits, for example, uh, and other uh, work that needs to be done to uh, kind of define a scope of work and uh, um, sort of get, get the building to, that, to the place where it's ready to be actually uh, retrofitted. Uh, next slide. And then, uh, as I mentioned, there are, uh, states are eligible to apply for the Solar for All funding, and uh, EPA required states to, that are interested in applying to submit a notice of intent. Uh, and so what we have here is um, the, number, the states that have actually, in green, have filed a notice of intent that they plan to submit an application for Solar for All to EPA. Uh, again, this is a notice of intent. We don't know the, the application deadline has passed, and we don't know if every single state that said that we said that they intend to apply actually did. Um, but you can see here that it's you know, the vast majority of the country. And then for those states in orange, uh, the the state did not indicate that they would uh, apply for solar for all funding, but there were either nonprofits or municipalities in those states that did file a notice of intent. So you know, with with those uh, states considered, you know, this is a Hopefully, the entire country will be covered in some capacity with solar for all funding. Next slide. And uh, I wanted to just give a few examples of um, what states are um, proposing to EPA as it, as it re relates to multifamily affordable housing. We are um, trying to, to track as, as much as we can um, what uh, applications uh, states submitted uh, and pull out that information. Um, we have three states here just as examples. So in Maryland, uh, the, the state is proposing $26 million uh, to go towards multifamily to serve 5,000 households. Uh, they intend to distribute funding in the form of low-cost uh, capital. Uh, and the state HFA in Maryland is going to be the lead in terms of uh, deploying this funding in multifamily affordable housing. Uh, Massachusetts requested a total budget of $400 million for all residential types and um, is gonna prioritize forgivable construction bridge loans for multifamily affordable housing. 
and in Minnesota, uh, $14 million uh, dedicated to multifamily out of the $100 million budget. Uh, they are, again, also looking at forgivable loans uh, and will be coordinating with the HFA to ensure that um, solar for all funding can be accessed in a streamlined way through the HFA financing process. Next slide. Okay, moving on to the clean energy tax credits. Um, wanted to start with the Section 48 Renewable Energy Investment Tax Credit, which the IRA extended um, uh, through 2032 um, and um, reinstated a 30% uh, base uh, tax credit rate. Um, that 30% base credit uh, is uh, for facilities that are less than one megawatt, megawatt or facilities that meet labor standards by providing prevailing wages and apprenticeship. Uh, there's a five-year recapture period with the tax credits. Um, and new with the IRA, uh, these credits can be sold to uh, unrelated parties uh, or provided um, uh, as direct pay to taxes and owners. Uh, and I, the Inflation Reduction Act also uh, made it possible for this tax credit to be used in low-income housing tax credit properties without reducing the eligible basis. Next slide. So there are several adders that can be added to that base tax credit rate. Um, for example, there's a domestic content um, adder that if, if the facility, the solar system um, uses US produced iron, steel and other products, uh, the, the facility owner can receive a 10% bonus in the tax credit rate. And that's available as of right. Uh, if, you, if you meet those qualifications, uh, you get that bonus. Uh, for energy communities, there's a 10% bonus also as of right. If the um, facility is located in certain communities like brownfields uh, and where there's been fossil fuel employment and closed coal mines. And then there's also a, a low income adder, which I'll, I'll go into in more detail that is competitive, it's not as of right, and it could be 10 or 20% uh, bonus. Um, and the, the chart here kind of shows the potential a total tax credit that a project can earn uh, based on these uh, various adders. Um, uh, the maximum would be 70% um, an ITC tax credit if you meet the domestic content bonus or located in the energy community and um, also get the low income 20% adder. Obviously that is gonna be very few projects. Um, you know, some of these uh, the criteria for domestic content in energy communities is, is pretty limiting. So there won't be that many facilities that are able to take advantage of it, but, but that is the full potential uh, based on the adders that are available. Next slide. So like I said, the low income adder is a competitive program. There's a, a maximum 1.8 gigawatts uh, of uh, renewable energy that will be allocated uh, each year. Um, for 2023, um, Treasury has identified uh, that has, has determined what that allocation will be by category. So the four categories include uh, low-income communities, which is basically uh, census tracts that meet the new market tax credit uh, uh, qualification. There's a 10% bonus uh, for those properties. Um, for Native American communities, also a 10% bonus. There's 200 megawatts um, for facilities on affordable housing properties. Um, and that's a 20% bonus, and then 700 megawatts for low-income economic benefit projects, and that's also a 20% bonus. Uh, and then focusing in on the uh, affordable housing um, uh, category, in addition to the 200 megawatts set aside, within that 200 megawatts, uh, tre uh, e Treasury has um, allocated 100 megawatts for any, qual any qualifying low-income residential project and then another 100 megawatts for qualifying projects that meet additional selection criteria, which I will discuss in a minute. Uh, next slide. In terms of the application uh, process, uh, Treasury uh, opened up a 30-day window from October 19th to November 18th uh, for, uh, to receive applications. Um, and all applications received within that 30-day period uh, are being reviewed equally. Um, and then after, once that's, you know, well, it has closed, obviously, um, November 18th was the closing date. Uh, Treasury is still um, considering uh, applications 
new applications on a rolling basis if capacity remains. Um, and we have information on you know how many how much of the available uh, capacity has been requested in that 30 day window and we have here what that looks like for the affordable housing category. Um, so for that category of any qualifying low income residential building project, uh, like I said, there was 100 megawatts of uh, capacity allocated and the applications that were submitted to Treasury represent 117 um, uh, megawatts. So that exceeds what Treasury has set aside for that for that particular category. Um, for qualified low income residential projects that uh, meet additional selection criteria, again, 100 megawatts was um, allocated for that category, uh, but only 44 application or so applications um, that equal only 44 megawatts uh, were received, which means that there is um, 56 uh, capacity remaining for that particular category, uh, and the additional selection criteria that um, Treasury has established uh, is, is both geographic and ownership. So uh, for geographic, the, the facility has to be located in a persistent poverty county or a low-income census tract with high energy burden uh, or high levels of fine particulates. And the um, regulations specify exactly how to determine um, which census tracts meet that standard. And then there's also a category of ownership. So um, Treasury is uh, uh, prioritizing um, facilities owned by qualified taxes and entities, as well as several other uh, categories of ownership um, that aren't, I don't think are quite as relevant to, to this group. Um, so uh, even though that window has closed, that 30 day window has closed, um, at least for the category uh, that prioritizes that additional selection criteria, um, there is still remaining capacity, so uh, uh, Treasury will, st will still be considering um, applications for the, the, the tax credit low income bonus. Next slide. Uh, and just briefly, here are some of the application requirements for affordable housing. Um, the, the solar facilities need to be pretty fairly far, far, far along in terms of planning for the uh, solar facility, including uh, if it's if it's a larger than a megawatt one megawatt facility, you need an executed interconnection agreement. Uh, you know, certainly execute executed contract to purchase the facility or lease it, um, and uh, several other criteria that I don't think we need to to go into in detail. Next slide. Uh, and then I wanted to touch on another uh, tax credit, forty five L, the new energy efficient home credit. Um, IRA change, this is an existing tax credit, but IRA uh, changed it so that it no longer reduces um, eligible basis for my tech properties. Um, the most recent information that's relevant to this tax credit is that DOE released final requirements for multifamily version two zero energy ready home certification. So um, building owners, developers can qualify for this tax credit uh, based on it, the value varies based on whether prevailing wage has been met and based on the standard that um, the the property meets, whether it's energy new construction or zero energy ready homes. Uh, in the past, zero energy ready homes has only been applicable to buildings of, of five story heights, five stories in height or um, or less. Uh, but the the new uh, multifamily standard now applies to uh, multifamily buildings of any size. Um, next slide. And then the final tax credit I wanted to highlight is section 179B, the energy efficient commercial buildings deduction. Um, this deduction still does reduce life tech eligible basis. I already did not fix that for this tax credit. Um, and it applies to commercial buildings and multifamily buildings of four or more stories above grade. Um, this applies to both new construction uh, uh, properties. New construction properties must uh, model at least a 25% improvement over the reference standard. And that reference standard, you can see in the, the bottom right table here, uh, changes over time. Uh, but it is based on ASHRAE, uh, ASHRAE standards. And then there's now a retrofit option. So um, buildings uh, five years or older can qualify for this tax credit. Um, uh, if they achieve a certain uh, uh, efficiency gain over baseline, 
uh, and the baseline is measured based on energy use intensity. And you can see in the, the top table here that the amount of the deduction varies based on uh, the level of energy efficiency gain, uh, as well as whether prevailing wage uh, uh, and apprenticeship, apprenticeship requirements are met. Next slide. So the final program I want to talk about is DOE Home Energy Rebates. Next slide. So this is um, a DOE program uh, that will provide $8.8 billion across the country uh, uh, that will be distributed through two separate rebate programs, one being the Home Efficiency Rebates, or HER, and the second being the Home Electrification and Appliance Rebates, or HERE. Um, so what I have here presented here are specific incentive levels for uh, buildings that meet the low income um, the low income target. So uh, for single family homes, households with incomes below 80% AMI, and in multifamily buildings uh, where at least 50% of households have incomes below 80% AMI can qualify for these incentive levels. Um, the home efficiency rebate only applies to existing buildings. It's intended to support retrofitting existing buildings. Uh, and the rebate level varies depending on the level of effic efficiency improvements. Uh, so for a uh, retrofit that is expected to achieve 20% to 34% savings, um, the, the building owner will qualify for a $4,000 rebate per housing unit. And that is doubled if the, the building uh, achieves uh, savings of 35% or more. For the electrification and appliance rebate, program, this program is uh, applicable to both new construction and existing buildings, um, and it's appliance-based rebates with specific caps. Um, and for low-income uh, households that, that meet that the definition, um, the max rebate level is $14,000 per housing unit. Uh, next slide. So I mentioned that the electrification and appliance rebate program is uh, it's a prescriptive program in that it will fund very specific measures and uh, provides uh, rebate amounts. These rebate amounts were uh, actually provided in the IRA legislation. So uh, these are the uh, maximum amounts that um, can be paid out for these various uh, electric measures. Next slide. As I mentioned, $8.8 billion, that should be uh, that should be a B, <laughs> not an M, fortunately. Um, are available and are, have been allocated to states based on a formula. Uh, and so here you see the range of allocations that uh, states will be receiving. Um, the 40% of that 8.8 billion must be spent, uh, must be allocated to low-income households and an additional 10% must be allocated to low-income multifamily households. That was DOE guidance to ensure that uh, this funding is uh, distributed equitably. Next slide. So DOE has provided um, program guidance. Um, this funding, I should, I should say, is going to be administered through state energy offices. Uh, and state energy offices will have to submit plans uh, for DOE approval. Uh, and so um, uh, DOE has put forth some guidance to give some direction to the states in terms of um, how they design those programs. I, I mentioned the minimum set aside. I will uh, also uh, specify that those are by DOE's, DOE really considers that minimum. So um, there is uh, the opportunity for states to uh, increase those set aside allocations. Uh, DOE has confirmed that in multifamily buildings, common area and full building energy savings are eligible. So the rebates uh, will don't will not just pay for the in-unit measures, but uh, will pay for common area and full building uh, energy efficiency upgrades and uh, electric uh, equipment. There will be a minimum affordability standard. Um, DOE has said that for uh, renting renter households that are are benefiting from this funding, uh, the building owner should ensure that uh, the uh, that the, the units that are impacted are occupied by a low-income uh, person for at least two years after the uh, rebates are provided. Um, and uh, also retrofit projects completed after August 16, 2022 uh, are eligible for the home efficiency rebate. So there is a retroactive opportunity if, if retrofits were done 
before the um, programs are launched, then and after August 16th, then it is possible for uh, those projects to receive rebates if the state chooses to implement a retroactive um, opportunity. Uh, there are key state decisions uh, left to be made, including how to treat um, uh, rebates in, in LIHTC properties. Um, rebates will traditionally be considered grants, so we are trying to ensure that they can also be structured as soft loans to ensure that um, they can be used in LIHTC properties without uh, reducing eligible basis. Uh, DOE was silent on the issue, but uh, we do believe um, that states have the flexibility to choose to address that challenge if they wish. Uh, like I said, uh, states can exceed the minimum set-asides. Um, and just in terms of the overall program design, there's a lot of discretion to states in terms of how they how they decide to, 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 to really design these programs to ensure that low-income households are served. Next slide. So you might be wondering, you know, when the rebates will be available to the public. This is um, sort of a, an exa a potential example timeline. Um, so states should have received administrative funding from DOE uh, over the fall, winter of 2023 to start their program planning. Um, right now, states, a lot of states are conducting stakeholder engagement to really inform program design priorities, uh, including how to equitably serve low-income households. That process will likely continue into quarter one 2024. Um, and then in certain cases, states may pursue an accelerated application to DOE for to expedite access to the rebates. And those are more likely states that have very robust existing energy efficiency programs that uh, can easily be leveraged. Uh, they have the infrastructure in place to, to distribute uh, these, these rebates. We don't expect many states are going to be able to take advantage of that uh, accelerated application opportunity. Uh, and then in quarter two, 2024, that's when we expect states to really submit full state, full programs to DOE and applications for funding. A lot of states also can do that, may also do that in Q1 2024, um, but I think most will probably uh, do that in Q2 2024. And then in Q3 through Q4, um, and hopefully certainly by the end of 2024, states should be uh, have their programs uh, up and running and should be able to start distributing rebates. Next slide. So that's it for me. I know that was quite a bit and that there might be some, some questions, uh, but for now, let's move on to Josh from New Ecology, who is gonna provide an example of innovation scope that might be uh, you know, eligible for some of this funding. Great, thank you, Todd. Um, Joshua Galloway with New Ecology. And we're happy to be partners with NHT in the IRA bootcamp. Next slide, please. We want to look at a property that we worked on two years ago, and it's located in Newark, Delaware. Um, the arrow pointing in the, the climate zone 4A. And this just gives us a little context for the country and where the different climate zones are. And I, I set this up because the, the solutions that we Put together for this property may not work everywhere in the country um, and so always good to to um, work with your local groups to figure out what the, the best strategies are in your location next please this property um, was built in 1973 and three-story walk-ups um, arranged around parking as you see here um, um, 165 apartments. Next, please. Existing buildings, um, brick, skins, and a lot of air leakage in the attics. And so like the top plates of walls were not sealed and just a lot of air movement through the, the building up into the attic. Um, they had a combination heat and domestic hot water boilers. And then air conditioning was provided by sleeved condensers. So just like a through wall unit. Next. The first thing we think about when we go to a property um, that is engaged in decarbonization or electrification is load reduction. Excuse me. So how do we make the building? Um, how can we make improvements to the buildings that reduce the amount of energy that they require to operate? So both looking at saving money, but also saving energy and freeing up capacity for other systems to be turned from fossil fuel to electric. 
Next, please. The scope of work um, at this property focused on air sealing. As I mentioned, there's a lot of air movement through the building. Um, and then after that air sealing, insulation in the attics. And with existing buildings, it's really important to either remove the existing attic insulation so you can find all those locations that need to be air sealed um, or um, sweep aside or move the insulation to one side of the attic, air seal, and then tackle the, the other side of the attic. Um, the attic floor is the um, kind of the hat of the building. And if that's not well air sealed, all that um, conditioned air that you're paying to heat and cool, it's just going to move right through the building to the outside. Um, exhaust fans, part of the, the ventilation strategy, and new lighting is part of that um, load reduction for using, uh, for reducing energy use. Next, please. There, those existing combination boilers provided heat to the buildings as well as um, hot water. And so we separated those two uses um, and have a, an air handler and outdoor unit, a, a mini split for each apartment. And there was some concern early on if going from a, a gas um, heating to electric would increase costs for residents because residents um, pay um, utilities based on their, they pay their electric bill. And so the whole scope was put together to make sure that the residents would not pay um, more. Um, they would be a similar, um, they would pay a similar amount of utilities um, that they do currently. And so the, the pieces of air sealing insulation um, appliances and um, low flow fixtures all helped reduce the energy use and reduce those costs. Domestic hot water was kept as gas, um, but they're central condensing um, gas water heaters. Um, and that's something that we, we see in, in properties is that um, some owners will go almost all the way to electrification and some will go all the way um, to full electrification. Next, please. So after a year, we went back and looked at the utility um, bills for the property and the, the water um, all paid by the owner and it was reduced by 42%, which is remarkable. Electricity, um, even with changing the heating from gas to electric heat pump, less than 1% change between pre and post electricity costs. Same with residents. So the residents, if they paid um, $80 a month for their electric bill, they would pay about $80 um, a month for their electric bill. And that was possible because we made the building that much more efficient. And so if you only electrify, if you take out the gas systems and put in electric systems, you could easily end up spending more for um, for heating and cooling. And so the important part is just to make sure that you're making the, the building much more energy efficient as part of the electrification scope. And then obviously taking out the gas heating, reduce the natural gas use by 78%. Next, please. So utility use is one, the other is cost savings. And so in, when water, um, a good reduction for the owner on the, the water used on the property, Electricity, again, similar, very little change in electricity use and natural gas is a, a huge reduction. Next, please. So we'd like to look at, at properties and buildings um, based on an energy use intensity or EUI. And before, the prop, before renovation, the property had an EUI of 83 and after um, of 36. And so that is a 57% reduction, um, which is, Pretty re remarkable. Um, we're also starting to look at operating emissions. And before renovation, it had a 5.2 kilogram per CO2 per square foot. And then after renovation, down to 2.7, um, almost a 50% reduction. Um, next, please. So how were these savings possible? We saved almost 50% in water um, and that is unusual, um, but does happen. And then in electricity, we're able to electrify and not um, increase the costs for utilities. Um, and it, two main reasons. One is the buildings were overheated um, before the renovation. So they had central gas 
boilers um, that just pumped a lot of heat into the buildings. The buildings were not very well air sealed. And so the residents would turn the thermostat to a certain set point. The boilers would um, turn on, heat the space. But because there's so many gaps in the ceiling and the walls and the windows, the heat would flow right through the building. And so the boiler was having to continually operate to keep a, a um, the set point. So the existing conditions were pretty poor. Post renovation, um, we were able to reduce the energy loads more than we expected to in the, the energy models we did. And it's also residents of myself included pay attention to thermostat set points when we pay for utilities. Um, so that the bottom line is that the we expected more heating energy to be used in the buildings than the actual um, actual data showed. And the decrease in the, the cooling, lighting, and appliances offset that heating energy increase. Um, this is a, an ideal solution. Um, an example is this not going to be the case every time. We're working with other properties where it's a much um, more difficult um, equation to figure out. But this just goes to show that you can have um, at least 20% in this case, um, more like 40 or 50% energy savings based on renovations um, with replacing systems that are at the end of their useful life um, within the kind of the, the budget of the property. And that is it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Joshua. Um, we're going to have some time for questions in just a few minutes, um, but now we're going to move into um, connecting these funding opportunities to your scopes of work. Um, this is relevant even for folks who aren't participating in the TA portion of the boot camp. Um, information still applies, um, even if you don't have that scope of work. Um, so for developers participating in the TA with New Ecology, um, you will receive or you've already received preliminary scopes of work that outline recommendations that fall under these categories. Um, so load reduction, which is reducing your building's energy usage to reduce utility costs and efficiently utilize the building's electrical capacity. This includes upgrading lighting, installing energy efficient appliances or water sense fixtures, insulating and sealing the exterior of the building and com compartmentalizing units. Um, system replacement, which is upgrading your heating and cooling and hot water systems, as well as improving ventilation. Um, indoor air quality, this usually is an outcome of addressing load reduction and system replacement, um, but it's focused on removing fossil fuel powered appliances and systems and electrifying units or buildings. Um, and addressing the building envelope through insulation, air sealing, ventilation, and dehumidification. Um, all of these measures help to improve the quality of your residence indoor air, um, creating healthier homes. And then also renewables where it made sense. Um, New Ecology recommended um, solar PV, battery storage, and identifying opportunities um, for resiliency hubs at your properties. Um, so now we're going to walk, talk through how each of these elements um, in detail and how the recommendations from New Ecology that they shared in our cohort calls and in the, in the scopes of work um, can connect to IRA programs that can help cover the cost of these upgrades. So as we said on the last slide, load reduction is upgrading the property's lighting, appliances, water fixtures, windows and doors, and air sealing and insulation of the building. Um, so a super easy switch that gives you immediate savings that New Ecology recommended was upgrading interior and exterior lighting to LED fixtures. Um, the elements cohort for GRP will cover the cost of improvements that lower the property's energy usage by at least 25%. Um, if you want to claim the 45L tax credit by way of Energy Star certification, there are also requirements for light bulbs and fixtures. Um, New Ecology also recommended upgrading your appliances, so dishwashers, clothes dryers, um, washing machines and refrigerators to Energy Star or better. GRP will cover 20% of appliance costs if converting from gas or oil to electric and specifically mentions covering ovens, cooktops, ranges, and clothes dryers. There were also recommendations to upgrade water fixtures and aerators to reduce water consumption. Um, similar to the lighting upgrades, this can be supported by the Elements cohort and by getting Energy Star certification for the 45L tax credit. Um, there's a lot of options for funding to seal and insulate all six sides of your building, so your attics, your crawl spaces, and walls. Um, New Ecology also recommends compartmentalizing units, which is sealing and insulating between each unit. Not only does this help to reduce energy consumption, but it deters sounds, odors, and pests, which of course will make your residents happy. 
Um, replacing windows and doors might not be the biggest energy saver, um, but it has good benefits for your tenant's level of comfort, um, which is what no ecology talk through in cohort sessions. Um, you can get partial funding from the elements cohort or the 45L tax credit um, if achieving Energy Star or Department of Energy Zero Energy Ready Home certifications. And a few quick notes um, before we move on to system replacements. Um, there is the option for states to give developers incentives for certain activities um, like air sealing and insulation in the DOE rebate. Um, eligibility for incentives will be determined by state, um, but DOE has guidance on how much the incentive can be for each qualifying activity. Um, there are additional funding opportunities through GRP for these um, upgrades not included in this slide. If you're eligible for the Leading Edge program, you can check off a lot of these recommendations based on which green building certification you're achieving. And the DOE home energy efficiency rebate covers whole building energy efficiency upgrades, so your building envelope and your insulation. Um, what's included for 45L is a general description of requirements for Energy Star and DOE zero energy ready home certifications. Each state adheres to a different version of Energy Star and zero energy ready home requirements. Um, like Todd said earlier, based on how many stories are in your building. And I'll note that California has some separate requirements for DOE, zero energy ready home. Um, for work funded by rebates, the combined individual cost of each appliance um, or material can't exceed the maximum rebate for the unit, which Todd said earlier, $14,000. So new, new Ecology included a number of replacement recommendations for heating and cooling and for hot water based on your region's climate and your property type but the common recommendations are listed in each of these columns. Um, there is funding available from HUD and DOE, as well as tax credits to upgrade to these heat pumps and potentially an increase in funding under HUD if you're switching from gas to electric systems. Um, Elements cohort will fund the actual cost for electrical, transformer, panel, or wiring work for projects pursuing electrification of any system or component or to accommodate other technologies funded by the award. Um, there is also a $2,500 rebate for electrical wiring and $4,000 rebate for electrical load service center under DOE's um, electrification and appliance rebate program. Again, states can offer developers incentives for certain activities here, like installing one or more heat pumps for hot water or heating and cooling. Um, the funding options listed in this category fund heat pumps for cooling, uh, heating and cooling and hot water generally. Um, I definitely recommend reading through each program's final guidance to confirm what types of heat pumps are covered, um, but typically if they meet energy efficiency and certification requirements outlined in the guidance, you should be good to go. Um, ventilation is also important to address energy efficiency and indoor air quality. Um, New Ecology included recommendations for an energy recovery ventilator, and there is funding from HUD and DOE to do this work. Um, as we mentioned earlier, and New Ecology highlighted on cohort calls, this work isn't just about making units more energy efficient, but it's also about creating healthy and safe homes for our residents. It's important that owners and developers are addressing issues at their properties like mold or moisture, pests, and removing and upgrading fossil fuel powered appliances and systems to electric ones. Um, the elements combined with the load reduction and system replacement recommendations all help to create safe and healthy and resilient homes for our residents. Um, this was mentioned a lot in the additional questions spreadsheet that were submitted to New Ecology in the fall for technical assistance. So I wanted to quickly highlight um, that HUD's element cohort will provide funding per unit for integrated pest management inspection, planning, and treatment, if that is helpful for anyone who qualifies for that program. Um, and then renewable energy is the last category of New Ecology's recommendations um, that we'll be talking about this afternoon. But there is a lot of funding coming available um, next year to support installing renewable energy at your properties. Um, so currently available, HUD's element cohort will cover the actual cost of rooftop or ground mounted solar, including any battery backups, participation in community solar programs and wind or geothermal energy generation. Um, Todd walked us through this earlier, but the low income community bonus tax credit program or 48E is currently reviewing applications to increase access for low income residents to wind and solar energy facilities. Um, and EPA will be distributing $7 billion in funding next year to create or expand solar for all programs across the country. Um, to ensure our properties are resilient, New Ecology has recommended or is encouraging you to think about what resiliency hubs could look like at your property. Um, for those that don't know, this is a space typically in a community room for residents to come together during or after a natural disaster to access resources like water or food, um, charge devices to stay connected. 
Um, and there's an increase in these being powered by solar renewable energy. So before we open up for questions, I wanted to quickly highlight how all of these funding opportunities can be stacked together. Um, federal agencies want to make these programs as accessible as possible, so they've included guidance that outlines how and when their funds can be combined with other programs. Um, most programs can be integrated with your state and local funding. I know many states have programs that support electrification efforts. Um, across the board, you can't use funds from different programs to pay for the same upgrade, so no duplication. Um, but there are some exceptions, with, like with 45L tax credits and um, HUD GRP. Um, EPA has not yet released guidance for stacking greenhouse gas reduction fund money with other programs, but we will share that information once available. Um, I know this is a lot of information, so we've added a slide at the end of this presentation that includes links to all these programs, um, some NHT resources, and as always, we'll post a slide deck and session recording to our website and include in a follow-up email. Um, before we do breakout rooms, I'm going to stop sharing my screen in case folks have any questions. Um, I know there was a couple in the chat from earlier portions of the presentation. Nope. Okay. So, um, in just a second, you should be able to select which room you would like to join. We're asking folks to select the room labeled as the IRA program that you think will provide the most opportunity to your organization or portfolio. Um, once everyone joins the room, NHT staff will help lead us through the questions listed on the slide. Um, so why you think this program provides the most opportunity, what are your challenges or questions in accessing IRA funds, um, and what additional resources will be helpful. Um, we'll then come back together um, to the larger group to share out what each group discussed, and it would be great if you could select a volunteer from your group to briefly summarize um, what you all discussed. So I'll open up the breakout room now, and you can go ahead and pick which one you want to join. And if you're not sure which one, you can just pick a random one. Madeline, where are the breakout? Do you, is it popping Rooms. up on your screen for you to select one? Not. Shoot. Um, it may be under other. I can assign you which one did you want to go to. There is. Uh, tax credit, EPA, um, HUD, or uh, the DOE rebate. I'll take DOE rebate. Thank you. Cool. You should get a notification. Recording. Um, does anyone want to volunteer from DOE or EPA or HUD to share what was discussed in your room? Okay. Sure. We'll go, let's go for it. We were the we were the DOE rebates, um, and um, uh, we, you know, one opportunity, you know, since GRP is kind of limited in terms of eligibility um, for properties that don't qualify for GRP, the rebates could be uh, a, a real uh, opportunity. Um, we also talked about new construction and the fact that. Uh, the electric rebates are available for new construction projects, not the um, the efficiency rebates, but the, the electric uh, rebates are. So that's another opportunity there for, for new construction. Um, I'll jump in uh, for the HUD GRP program. We were just getting started. We, we were having a great conversation, so we feel like we could talk for another half hour easily. Um, but th there are several folks talked about looking um, for their for their LIHTC properties, their tax credit properties. They were considering 4% LIHTC applications. Um, and this 
um, the HUD GRP look like a good alternative or a complement to an existing 4% refinance um, application. So either uh, the elements or the leading edge uh, cohort of the GRP look like a really good opportunity. Um, a couple of others are looking at the comprehensive path um, in the GRP and just getting started there. One interesting note is that several people noted that they are be they are being inundated with information on the GRP, just so much information from many, many different sources in their organization, like coming at them from their contact stakeholders in the industry. Um, and it's almost overwhelming. They don't even know like where to start. So it was interesting that there's a ton of information out there on the GRP. Um, Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Um, EPA. EPA I was in that room. I was in the EPA group, but Ruby asked a good question. I think that started our conversation, and us, we too also had just begun when you were bumped out of the room. So Ruby, do you mind sharing your question and what you took away? Yeah. Um. So. I think uh, it was Mercy and then Catalan and also senior Hebrew housing that we were in the same group and we all are trying to mod, uh, plan our portfolio pipeline uh, for the coming years to see how we can use the GGRF funds for our new construction as well as for our existing properties, which are nearing the 20 year term, which are um, upcoming for our uh, life act transaction. And the question that I asked was that how do we prepare ourselves for the results which are going to come out in March? And how do we assume which is the sweet spot for these loans to work for us? Because the modeling has been a question mark for us. Uh, because one thing is clear that these loans are going to, uh, GGRF is not going to be a grant. So it's going to be a loan. And to make sure that we can actually utilize these green loans, we need to make sure that applicants who win this money are going to give it to us in a term that works for us. And it's just feasible for us to run the model that. So I was just trying to understand from the different organizations how are they planning for that. And we were just starting on the conversation. I'm sorry for cutting everyone off so <laughs> so deep into conversation. I um, think uh, Kathleen shared a one good example that they are planning it, planning to use it as a portfolio loan versus distributing the loan to individual properties, which was one good uh, idea. Um, and we'll circle back around to like those kind of questions ish uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, but I anything else for EPA? No. Okay. Um, so I was in the um, tax credit group. Um, so we kind of were talking about how tax credit isn't like the the only option. It's one of the options for developers um, in terms of doing energy efficiency and electrification work at their properties. Um, some challenges they're kind of world people are running into is, you know, underwriting it for tax credit allocations, um, just trying to figure out how they can bring that into project financing, um, taking things slowly just because information is still coming, trying to figure out what their options are, um, and then making sure they're they're able to look at all the options they have for their properties to get the most holistic approach um, and, and work done. And then in terms of additional resources that could be helpful is kind of clarifying what funds can apply for new construction and what funds can apply to the retrofit. Um, so um, NHT will talk internally about getting something that kind of helps outline that. Um, and we'll also circulate the stacking resource that kind of outlines um, what funds can be coupled together. Um, and then just another interesting tidbit is curious to see how the funds trickle out geographically. Um, we saw the map for, for GERP. It's kind of um, centered on the, on the East Coast. So just to see how the next cohorts um, play out. Um, so I will quickly move on to the next portion of the presentation. We're almost finished. Unless there's any pressing questions folks have, um, I don't want to dive in with Sarah. Okay. So um, next steps for technical assistance. If you submitted files in September and are participating in the first round of technical assistance, New Ecology should have or will send preliminary scopes of work for your properties. Um, in these spreadsheets, there will be some additional questions for you to answer. Please make sure to submit those by um, New Ecology's deadline. Um, it should be in the email they send you. Um, also, be on the lookout for an email from me to schedule one-on-ones with New Ecology staff before the end of the year. Um, from there, New Ecology will finalize the recommendations for your properties. 
And if you're planning to participate in our second round of TA in January, um, if you haven't already done so, you need to submit to your MBEST and additional question spreadsheets um, for up to four properties by January 26th. Um, that then we'll work, New Ecology will then work with you through March to finalize recommendations for your properties. If you have any questions about this process, please let me know. Madeline, can I just really quick? Um, yeah. uh, the one-on-one -on -one questions will be happening at the meetings will be happening at the very end of December and beginning of January. I just wanted to clarify that. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so since this is our last session, um, we would love to hear from all of you about your experience participating in the boot camp. Um, I'm going to send a follow-up email with a link to a survey that will collect feedback on our sessions and resources um, and just whether or not this has been a helpful um, resource for you all. Um, it would be great if you could complete the survey by December 22nd. Um, many of you will still be engaged in the bootcamp through our TA, um, but we will continue to share information with developers through our IRA newsletter and we're monitoring opportunities for you through your state rebate and solar for all programs. So hopefully we'll be able to share information um, about you know, how you can kind of make sure these programs work for you like we were talking about after the breakout session. Um, and finally, if you're interested in applying for GRP, NHC and Enterprise will be hosting a webinar next Thursday at 1230 to talk through lessons learned, tips for um, other applicants um, based on their successes. And um, I can send you the registration link for that um, if you want to just ping me afterwards. Um, I also really want to thank all of you for participating in the IRA bootcamp over the last seven months. It's been really great working with all of you. Um, and we hope these sessions have been helpful. Um, a huge thank you to New Ecology for providing partnership um, through TA for our participants. Um, and NHT is always available to chat with you all about the IRA. So please don't hesitate to reach out to Todd, Danielle, um, or I at any point. Um, link to the resources that we'll send out afterwards. But that's it. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you so much for all your help. Yeah, have a safe and happy holiday.